Hallelujah. First, giving honor to God, who is the head of my life. Lord, I thank you for this opportunity and for just for your goodness. Giving honor to my pastor. Um, I prayed for this pastor. I prayed for you, Apostle Quick, and the Lord, he did answer the prayer. Uh, and so I, I, I honor you and I bless you. I bless you, co-pastor, first lady, uh, the elders, and everyone in their respective places. Um, and I also honor my wife. I pray for her too. And the Lord answered exactly as I prayed. And I uh, thank you for proving that a prodigal can be redeemed all the way to the throne of marriage. So, um, and I bless my, bless the Lord for my children, Harrison and Reed, and, uh, and I, uh, Pastor, I thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I'll say a quick prayer. Father God, show us your ways, O Lord. Teach us your paths and guide us in your truth and teach us. For you are God, you are our Savior, you are our only hope. Open our eyes to see wonderful things in your law. Open our ears to hear what your spirit says to the churches. Break up the fallow ground of our hearts so that we will be good ground for your word and bear much fruit by your spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. So I am tasked to do the parable of the prodigal son. And Pastor, I don't know if you know this, and you probably do, because I do believe sometimes you can read my mind. Um, but um, I lived this parable, and yet and still today the Lord showed me something completely different. And so I'm just going to read it. And he said, a certain man had two sons. This is uh, Luke 15, verse 11. And he said, a certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after the younger son gathered all together and took his journey into a far country and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land and he began to be in want. And and he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husk that the swine did eat, and no man gave, him, gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my fathers have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. And am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, bring forth the best robe and put it on him. And put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring hither the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his elder son was in the field and he came and drew nigh to the house and he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said unto him, thy brother is come and thy father hath killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore came his father out and entreated him. And he answered, and, and he answering said to his father, Lo, these many years I do serve thee. Neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment. And yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this thy son was come, which hath devoured thy living with harlots, thou hath killed for him the fatted calf. And he said unto him, Son, Thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. It was meet that we should be, make merry and be glad, for this thy brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. Amen. Uh, 
my subject, if there is such a thing, would be quite simply, what are you asking for? And that can be said two ways. What thing are you asking for? What reason are you asking for? Because, you know, when you say it either way, it's said differently. What are you asking for? Or what are you asking for? So that's, that's my subject. So the, I took a walk with the Lord and just listened to Luke today, and I didn't quite make it to Luke 15, but I noticed in Luke that Luke is a very familial book. It begins with a focus on two children. Uh, chapter 1, verse 17, John the Baptist op he says he will be operating in the spirit of Elijah, Malik, which is a quote from Malachi 4, 6, where the, fathers of the, the heart of the fathers will be turned to the children, which is our CFAD. It's like the core of CFAD, at least I, I, I believe that it is. I've heard it so much here, and I never really even noticed that until we came here, and it's like that. I see that everywhere the fatherlessness in the world, and, that, and it's like, so this, be, this book begins there. And then we go from John the Baptist to Mary, Mary and Elizabeth. It talks about uh, two pregnancies, very unlikely pregnancies. Um, but in ver chapter 1, verse 37, it says, nothing is impossible with God. You have a barren woman who all of a sudden is going to give birth. You have a virgin woman who all of a sudden is going to, get bir going to give birth. So whatever your situation is, saints of God, God is able to speak life into that situation regardless of what anyone says. And God, I, I'm going to declare this, that CFAD will be successful. Right. And here's, here's how I know it, because it, the Bible tells me so. The Bible begins with the family and it ends with the marriage. And so there is no doubt that that is on the heart of God. And so it is going to be successful because God wills it. And we can see that even in this book. God moves from these two children, and he starts then talking about his own son. And in uh, Luke 3, he says to Jesus in front of other people, Thou art my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Fathers, speak that affirmation to your children. To them in front of others, just, I mean, that, that word, could you imagine, even though Jesus was God, to have it be declared, because he was also human too. But to have it declared, God saying, this is my son. You are my son. I'm well pleased with you. He's like, I'm good. And so then we see it move, moving on. He's, he does it again. In, in chapter 9, verse 35, he says it to the crowd. This is my beloved son. Hear him. And then he walks us through the genealogy of Jesus back to Adam, which he calls the son of God. So from one son of God to the son of God, it's like all of this is family and family, and it just keeps building upon family. And he goes back again to talking about God's family. In chapter 7, verse 35, he says, wisdom is justified of all her children. In chapter 8, verse 21, he says, Jesus says, my mother and brothers are these who hear the word of God and do it. And then from there, we get to uh, just the families that cross Jesus's paths. You got Jairus dealing with a believe in God for something for his daughter. You got Martha and Mary. You got a feud, a family feud of siblings. You got a father with a possessed son in uh, chapter 9, verse 42. You got the man who was possessed by legion who wanted to go with Jesus once he was delivered. But Jesus said, go back to your home. He'd been away from his family long enough. Go back to your home and show them what God has done. And in all of these, in, in these two areas where he raised Jairus' daughter from, back from the dead, he tells them not to say anything. But if you think about it, there's really no need for them to say anything. They, that change in that family would be visible to all. And that's, the, that's, that's what CFAT is, is doing. It's the success of CFAT is the success of our families. And it's, the, it's as our families are strengthened, as our families are changed, as we break generational cur curses, as the, 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 the struggles and challenges in my own family that God has unearthed and allowed me to see and pray for, those are the things that will, will speak to the testament of what God can do. And so we, now we get to our parable where we have this prodigal son who dared to ask for his inheritance before his father was, before his father was dead. That's not proper. It's, all, it's an insult. It's a slap in the face because he wanted the gift and not the giver. And he, but he was not rebuked. And the father gave him what he wanted, what he requested, and, and sent him on his way. And then he wasted his living because if you think about it, God 
has already given us gifts and talents that we can use apart from him, but in the end, we will end up destitute at the end of ourselves and in a position where we now realize what all of those gifts were for. And I'm not telling you what I read, I'm telling you what I lived. And, and then I look, I look forward at this, and he says, as he learned that lesson, he came back home. And he's like, what am I doing? Why am I in this place? I know better. I was instructed better. You know, I've, I've heard some of the saints here talk about how there were people here that were here that left, and then now their children, things have happened with their children, and now they, they reach back out because they, they realize now that what they had. And we don't want that to be us. We, we know what we have, so align with what we have and apply what we have. Uh, and then as we, so, but when he comes back, he celebrated and loved, and the father ran to meet him from afar off. Now, my, my subject, what, did it, what, did he, what are you asking for? He asked for his blessing. He got his blessing. He asked for a life that was outside of the will of his father. And he got it. And then he got everything that came along with it. Now, thankfully, he was able to turn that thing back around and he got redemption. But there are many people who, when they take that step, they don't come back home. And they go on to hell because they died outside of the will of God and never got to know God. But so in this case, this, this brother got to come home. But when you look back, you say, what are you asking for? What are you asking for? For this brother. The older brother, well, the brother who stayed home. He was angry when his brother came home. And he, he would not even enter in to the celebration for his brother. That speaks to a different type of heart. And the day that a co-pastor told me that this was my assignment, I, turned, I got in my car, turned the radio on, and I don't know who the preacher was, but all he said was, and I, mean, I wrote it down, so let me, give me one second. He said, love does not matter unless action demonstrates it. Action does not matter unless love motivates it. And, and I just... I grabbed a hold of that because when I started digging into this parable, I realized that this young, this son who stayed home, he, he said a few things about himself. Uh, he said that he had been with his father the entire time. He had never transgressed his law. He was doing the right things. He was in place. He was on time. He was uh, in dress code. He was doing those things, but love was not motivating those things. So those things were useless and worthless. And so then his father, while the father had to run out to greet the prodigal son, the father had to go out to get him and he was home. And so he was extended the same grace, even though he didn't realize it. And so as I was looking at that, I looked at this verse 31. He says, well, I'm sorry, let me back up. He, he says, Yes, verse 31. He says, and he said unto him, son, thou art ever with me, and all that I have is thine. He didn't ask. He never asked for those things. Because if you look back at the beginning of the parable, when, when the younger son asked for his goods, it says in verse 12, and he divided unto them his living. Because he would have to, he would have to take everything and say, this is his this is his, this is his, this is his, this is his, this is his. And now he got two equal piles piled up, plus some for this son. This son got a pile, but he also got everything daddy got and making for the uh, uh, cattle on a thousand hills. But he ain't ask. And so now he's looking like you never gave me, gave you. You've you been with me the whole time. And so that made me think, and uh, I was asking God to, show me that this is the direction he wanted to show me and then uh, lady quick your message confirmed it because I as I was going through ask he said ask and it will be given seek and you will find knock and it will be opened and he said this is what God said about his his family if ye then being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask and then in chapter 12, verses 22, he says, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, 
what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. And uh, verse 23 says, the life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. And then verse 30 says, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that you have need of these things. But rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Saints of God, you don't, in this story, there really was no good son. Uh, the, both sons had, had an issue because the, the, the prodigal son would have said that he loved his father, but his actions did not demonstrate that. The son who stayed home would have said that, you know, hey, I'm doing everything. Can't you tell that I love you? But then when you see he had no love, he could not understand how that familial fatherly love could bring his brother in. And so as we see, you know, from whatever stage we are in, when God, as the good father, invites someone in or someone starts making their way toward him and he runs to get them, those, those types of blessings will happen quickly for the one who has been lost and is now returned. Those blessings happen quickly. So you start to see it very quickly. So is, the temptation is for those of us who are in Christ and have been in Christ and we are like, well, Lord, I've been, what about me? I've been, I've been trying, I've been doing right. I've been doing these things, but God is saying, unless you can celebrate your brother's return, from death to life, I cannot, I can't, I can't give you what you need. And then lastly, last but not least, I'll just say this. What are you asking for? Co-pastor told us in 199 Men that you've got to put a, put a demand on God, a God-sized demand. So whatever that situation is, a barren, barren womb or a family a curse of drugs or dysfunction or whatever that thing is, like, whatever that thing is that people say, man, that ain't never going to change. There ain't nothing you can do about that. You're just going to have to deal with that. The devil is a lie. God can do anything but fail. But are you asking? What are you asking for? Are you asking for your own personal glory so that I can say, oh, I got this. I got a new house. I got a new car. Or are you asking so that your life can be changed and you can be a witness unto God and to, for other people for what God can do? And at the end of the day, that's what it's about. Um, and I'll leave you with this last thought. And this, this book really, uh, this parable really challenged me, Pastor. And I thank you for this opportunity because I am, a, I am this guy. And I tell you, God can bring, God, God can do it. God can do it. Don't ever believe that he can't. And when I see, I see the things that God is doing with the young brothers in this church, I see the things that, that God is doing with you, Pastor, and the things that he's doing with this ministry. I'm a prodigal son who when I came home, I still was prodigal. And, I, and then God put me through a wilderness period. And all of that to bring me to the promised land. God is good. God is good. So what are you, what are you asking for? I, I've asked God to do two things for us and for CFAD. I've asked God to strengthen our hands for battle so that we can bend a bow of bronze. And I've asked God to, to do something that is bigger than we could ever imagine. And that 5,000, 50,000 families is too small. It's going to be even bigger than that. And that's, all, that's what I pray every day in Jesus' name.